Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you so much, Lord, for your, your, your many and wonderful blessings, Lord. To see the love that you pour out on us, and Lord, that we, we just overflow. Lord, we overflow in praise, we overflow in worship, we overflow in, in, in thanksgiving and gratitude to you, Lord Jesus. We thank you for loving us the way that only you can. And Lord, as always, as we get into your word, Lord, that we would be nourished and nurtured by it. That you would teach us, Lord, who you are. And then use us to glorify your name. Thank you, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Turn once again to Colossians chapter 3. Somebody was asking earlier what these little side things were about. Oh, yeah, that's it. As we were in uh, verses 18 in there, a couple of verses that we got through last week, we've been talking about who we are in Christ. Uh, as Paul's letter to the church of Colossae reminded them of who he is, what he's done, and who we are in Christ. And that we're to be set apart and separate from the world. We're to be different. We're to put off the old things of the flesh and put on the new things of Christ as new creatures in Christ. And then he goes into in this chapter 3 here talking about the character of that new man. The meekness, the long-suffering, the love that we have for one another. And the importance of showing that being a Christian, displaying that Christ-likeness in our home. We talk about how oftentimes it's really easy for us to meet you know, godly Christians hanging out with a bunch of godly Christians, right? And so one of the important things about fellowship, because we kind of hold each other accountable in, in ways like that, isn't it? Sometimes it's a little more difficult when we get home, for whatever reasons. Sometimes it's a little more difficult when we get out there in the world. To be that light that shines, that Christ likeness to other people. But it's important, and the Lord begins here with our homes, with that relationship between the husband and wife. God instituted marriage, He said, The two shall come together and become one, and what God has joined together. <coughs> marriage is, is, a, is a God thing, it's His work, it's what He does. We can go pick somebody and marry them and hope God blesses that. But we're always better off if we let Him bring us together. Amen. Let it be Him. And it's always His marriage who He has brought together. Let no one tear apart. Because the best way to, to mess up a marriage is for us to start working on it. Over the years and, and, and talking to couples and everything, you find out that they're, well, we're working on our marriage. Why? Well, are you letting God work on it? Well, no, we haven't got to that yet. <laughs> Let's just start there. It focuses on Christ, and He's the center of that. And the desire to please Him. Jesus is first in your life, and all of your need, all you need, all sufficient. Wives submitting, that spirit of cooperating with your husbands, husbands loving your wives. It said, as Christ loved the church. That's a tall order, isn't it, guys? Amen. Yeah, through him and, and the, the oh, careful there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, through the Holy Spirit, his equipping, he's equipped us to do that. To have that agape, unconditional love. And remembering that love is a choice, a decision that we make that says we're going to treat someone in a Christ-like manner. We're going to be gracious and merciful and forgiving. Well, you need those things in any relationship, don't you? Especially in these. We can move on to talk about children and children obeying your parents in all things. For this is well pleasing to the Lord. Talks about that, that commandment to, to honor your mother and father so you may live long in the land. If you don't, you may not live so long. Or you might live in a different land. Honoring your parents, placing value on them. And it doesn't say little kids. 
And there's a difference in the way that we obey our children as little kids under their care and as adults, adults, but still honor evaluating them. And they went into fathers, do not provoke your children, in verse 21, lest they become discouraged. We can be so harsh and demanding on our children that we discourage them instead of encourage them to grow. There's the other side of it that we see so often in one of the little catchphrases I've heard out there for parents these days and raising their children. Again, they're going to have what is it, their free parenting or free range kids or whatever they call them. You know, basically it's kind of well, just let them do their own thing and be yourself and all that stuff and just kind of, you know, look out for them and, I don't know, or let them eat whatever they want to eat or do what they do. I don't know. The Bible tells us spare the rod and spoil the child. We need to make sure that we get that and understand it correctly. It's if you spare the rod, if you don't discipline, if you don't put those boundaries there for that child, if you don't teach them to have self-control and self-discipline, then that child will be spoiled. You ever go in a refrigerator and go, oh man, I remember those leftovers that we had. That sounds so good, I'm going to go warm them up. And you go in there and you get out and you open it up and it's got all this little crazy little green and hairy stuff coming out of it. You know, that's spoiled. Spare the rod and spoil the, the child. Even our Heavenly Father disciplines those whom He loves, chastens them. It says, your rod and your staff will comfort us in Psalm 23. That's to lead, to guide, and correct. Correct. Talk about how the Father has the responsibility uh, as the head of the house to be that example that of Christ's likeness in that household as the responsibility is accountable to God for training up a child in the way that they should go, for building that biblical foundation that they will build their lives on. The responsibility of the father as head of the household to do that. And so often we talk to people, we talk to to, to men and they go, oh, you know, I just got to let the wife take care of that stuff. Or you get the parents that go and they say, well, you know, I want my kids to, to make their own choices about religion and everything like that. So I drop them off at Sunday school on Sunday morning and, then, you know, me and my husband, him and the wife, whatever, the parents go out for breakfast someplace and pick them up two hours later. That's called babysitting. It's called ditching the kids in a place that you think is safe, not taking that responsibility. The men, believers, Christian men, we are responsible to God for laying that foundation, for training up those children the way that they are, for being that example of godliness to our children, to our spouses, to our wives, and to those around us as, as they observe our household. Joshua said, as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. And he puts himself in first place for responsibility. He didn't say, as for my household, eh, then me. We will serve the Lord. Me and my household. I'll be that example. It's our responsibility. He moves on in, in chapter 3, verse 22. We'll jump in here this morning. It says, bond servants. Obey in all things your masters according to the flesh, not with eye service as men pleasers, but in sincerity of heart, fearing God. And whatever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance. For you serve the Lord Christ. But he who does wrong will be repaid for what he has done. And there is no partiality. Masters, give your bond servants what is just and fair, knowing that you also have a master in heaven. A couple of verses there that speaks to bond servants. We know what bond servants are. We've talked about that often. We go through and we read these different letters. Paul often refers to himself as Paul, a bond servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's one who has 
given themselves over to their master willingly to serve them. We would look at this today and it would be employees serve your employers obey them in all things according to the flesh. Be a good employee. I know a lot of you are lucky enough to be retired but many of us are still working. All of us are still serving the Lord. As a bondservant, as someone who's employed who's serving in some way, someone so obey your masters according to the flesh, not with eye service as men pleasers. You ever meet those people that walk up to you and they shake your hand and they got a big smile on their face and they pat you on the back and they tell you all kinds of things you want? Or you got that person that, 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 that's employed, that's working for you and everything, and they, they go, oh yes sir, yep, anything you want, you got it, I'll do it, I'm right on it. And they go and they don't do it. They, they make things look good. There's that eye service, that men pleasers. They're doing it, trying to gain favor with people, but not necessarily always doing what they're supposed to do. Making it look good on the outside. He says to obey them in all things according to the flesh, not with eye service. Not just trying to make it look good. In other words, putting on a front. People talk about Christians oftentimes, well, I don't know, just a bunch of hypocrites. A bunch of posers. Just acting. A hypocrite, that's the idea, it's the actor, it's the one that puts on a mask. Yeah. Sometimes we do it in, in our, our Christian walks, sometimes there are those that do it in the workplace and they're asked, oh, yes, yeah, yeah you're, you're important, we want to make you, you feel good. I've been in a situation as a pastor where at one time, not here, but someplace else, someone that came along for a while in a church and everything, and they said, oh, man, listen, let me take you out, take you and your wife out and, and buy you lunch and all that stuff. Yeah. Yeah, that's all right, you know, do that every now and then. Rather just do it by my own. But after a while of this going on, it's like, you know what? Why are you always just asking me? There's a whole lot of other people in this church, some of them, that it would be a great treat and blessing for you to take them out to lunch. Because it's not something that they can do on their own very often. Why don't you try that? Oh, no, that didn't happen. Why? It's all about eye service. It's all about the man pleasing. Oh, if somebody important, well, let's go hang out with them. Let's impress them. You do that as bond servants were to do that, not as men pleasers, not necessarily just to please them, but with sincerity, no falsehood, sincerity of heart, doing it wholeheartedly because you should, because it's the right thing to do. When people hire somebody, it ought to be one of those things that you want to put on your resume or something about being a Christian. It ought to matter to someone. We ought to have the reputation as Christians of being the best people to employ. You got a Christian man, you want them because they're going to be a good, honest, hard working individual. And what are we told in the scriptures? Jesus said, if somebody compels you to go a mile, do what? Go to. Yeah, drop the stuff at three quarters of a mile and call it good. <laughs> yeah. Because everybody else put it half a mile, right? No, go the extra mile. Why? In sincerity of heart. Because it's the right thing to do as a believer. Because our witness in those places and in those situations matters too. You have to be the one to say, yeah, man, let's, let's get some Christians in here and hire them. Unfortunately, I've heard other people say, yeah, you know, you get those Christians in here, they always got some excuse for not doing this or not doing that, or, you know, they're over here and they're taking longer than they ought to for their lunch break because they're over here talking about Jesus to somebody instead of doing what they're supposed to do and, and all that. And, well, you know, you're going to serve the Lord first. Yeah. The Lord says, be a good employee. Be an example. If you have the opportunity to share the Lord within that, do it. Be that good employee with sincerity of heart, fearing God. 
You know, you might work for somebody that will let you get away with a lot of stuff. But you know that the Lord sees everything, don't you? All of that stuff. Do it fearing, honoring, respecting, regarding God. And whatever you do, do it heartily as unto the Lord and not to men. I have been, and I'm sure some of you are, probably most of us that have ever had a job for very long. There's been those times where, where it's just like, man, I don't want to do that for them. You run across some people that are just rude, harsh, meek, ungrateful, demanding, and just tough to get along with. And sometimes in the course of our work and our serving and everything like that, we have to deal with them. Working, working for the school, doing maintenance at the school and stuff like that. There's some people that you just, anything they want, you do, yeah, you got it, man. And there's others that, you? To be honest with you, there's times you go, all right, Lord, you need to drag me down here. <laughs> Yeah. But it's not about them. It's not about serving them. We get into that place where sometimes, well, but they don't deserve. They don't deserve it. I remember working for a guy one time that used to show up to work. I, I, I first figured this out. I, I, I passed him on the road going to work. He's doodling along. And it's, you know, 5 36 o'clock in the morning. He's driving along. He's got his beer tipped up and all that. He carried his little box around with him and he'd sneak off and go have a beer here and there. It was easy because we worked out at the out in Wickenburg at the it's called the Wickenburg Ranch, a little dude ranch out there, and we could go out in the desert and stuff. You know, by the end of the day, you know and all that. It's hard to have any respect or to serve someone like that. Not that it was a, a mean guy, it's just one of those situations where the Lord reminds you, do what you're doing as unto Him. And still be that good boy. And I don't feel like working for them. I don't feel like doing it. They're so ungrateful. They're so harsh. It doesn't matter. The Bible tells us this, and this is one of those things I like, I like to come back to. And I need to be reminded of, frankly, every once in a while. It says to treat others as you would have them treat you. Well, look that up sometime when you're when you're sitting there thinking about it. And what you're going to find out is that's a command. And it's to us. It says, treat others as you would have them treat you. There's no ifs. There's no ors. There's no buts. It doesn't say to treat them the way you feel they deserve to be treated. It doesn't say tell you to treat them the way that you would like to be treated if they respond in the way that you want. Well, I treated them that way and they didn't respond. I did this for my boss. I'm such a good worker. I do everything he wants me to. And he's still riding me, upset, whatever. Doesn't matter, does it? Treat others the way you want to be treated. Serve them as you would Christ. Because in doing so, you are serving Christ. People talk about their ministry. Oh, it must be nice to be called into the ministry. Are you saved? Are you a Christian? Yes. Guess what? You're a minister. We've been through this. You're called into the ministry. Well, what's my ministry? I don't know. What do you do? Where do you go? Who do you see? Who are the people that God brings into your life? Minister at home? Minister to your children? minister at work as you're ministering to and for the Lord. Amen. Do it as unto Him. Sometimes it's difficult to do what we ought to do for people. And here he says that that shouldn't be the motivation because now we're just being men pleasers. We have those people that, that are, are, are men people, people pleasers, well, you know, just trying to make sure that everybody's happy. Well, start with making sure that the Lord's happy. That you're seeking first His kingdom and His righteousness. Put that first. Start with that. And when you do, guaranteed, 
Some people aren't going to be happy. There are some people out there that no matter what you do, they are not going to be happy. Right? You know some of those people, don't you? No matter what you do, they're not going to be happy. So don't do these things as men pleasers. But whatever you do, do it heartily as unto the Lord and not to men. You're where you are doing what you do. And think about John working with the, the power company and all the calls that he gets with the customer service and everything. He's like, but I'll tell you what, you want to see some way that God's given patience and grace. There you go. Do it as unto the Lord, not them. Because you're not going to make them happy. Do it as unto the Lord, knowing that from the Lord you will receive reward of the inheritance. For you serve the Lord Jesus Christ in whatever we're doing. Remember as it said back here, whatever you do, do it as unto the Lord. Amen. Whatever you're doing, whoever you're serving, whoever you're, whatever you're dealing with, Whoever you're working for, your real boss is the Lord. He's your Lord, isn't he? Is he? Do it as unto him, regardless of how the people respond, whether they deserve it or not. Do it as unto the Lord. And that means maybe you've got you're in that situation where that master, that boss, that employee or something may be asking you to do something that's wrong. That's immoral. It goes against what the Bible teaches us. You know, this and this and that happened and everything like that. Don't tell anybody. And if anybody else, tell them this. You ever been in that situation? You go back to the guy that was drinking on the job. I told him, I said, because it wasn't long before he, he was popping a beer in front of me. And I said, whoa, right there. Before you go any further, you need to know this. As long as you're not putting anybody else in danger, I'm not going to say anything. But if anybody comes up and asks me if I have ever seen you drink on the job, I will not lie. And so you consider what you want to do. <laughs> you know? It didn't bother me. Anyhow. <laughs> We're doing it. We're working for the Lord. And we will receive, we might get a paycheck from our box. And that's the Lord providing provisions for the things in this world. But the real reward is going to come from Christ at the Bema Seat. We're rewarded for those things that we've done in His name. To honor Him, to glorify Him. Not the things that we did to make people happy as men pleasers, as people pleasers. You see, and you hear it all too often about the people that are philanthropists. Now, all of them go around doing good things. The guys that show up with the great big checks. You know, the people that do stuff. And, and when they're asking about, why did you do that? Oh, you know, it just makes me feel so good to give back. Well, that's being a men pleaser, pleasing yourself. As a Christian, as a believer, you know what? This is what the Lord's called me to do. And I do it to honor and glorify my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That same guy that I worked for that was, was, was drinking on the job and everything, before I left that place, it was time for me to, to move on and, and do different things. I, I turned in my notice and everything like that. And he told me, he said, man, he says, you've just really been... A, a, such a, a, a great employee, not to my mind, he's been such a, a great employee, employee I think. He says, I don't know why I didn't deserve it. I looked at him and I said, well, you know, I didn't do it for you. He goes, well, what do you mean? Said, I did it for the Lord. Because this is where he put me. I didn't do it for you. You were the beneficiary, beneficiary, if you will, of my serving the Lord in this do it as unto the Lord and administer to Him too. So, you know, through the time I was there, there were plenty of opportunities to share the Lord with their place. Our inheritance says, For you serve the Lord. In everything, in all that we do, we're doing it serving the Lord. 
representing Christ. Jesus says, you call me Lord, Lord, right and so. But unfortunately, that's followed with, why don't you do the things that I ask you to do? Being in that, uh, in that position of having people that, that, that work for me, I understand that. Yeah, boss, you got it. Anything you say. Did you do this? Well, no. Why not? I don't know. He's our Lord. We serve Him in all things that we do. Verse 25 it says, But he, he who does wrong will be repaid for what he does, and there is no partiality. <laughs> He who does wrong will, will be repaid for what he does. And we go, yeah, right on. There's no partiality. Well, that means me too. Well, wait a minute, we're Christians. We're, we're saved. Are, aren't we under grace? Yeah, we are. Remember, he chastens those whom he loves. Those who do wrong, they'll get there. Those who mistreat you, those bosses that take advantage, those people that, that you have to, to, do, to deal with, when you're serving the Lord and treat them in the way that He would treat you or the way you would, you would want to be treated and all that. If they do wrong and they take advantage of you, what do we do? Pray for them, right? Amen. Pray for those who take advantage, who spitefully use you and all that stuff. Like, let the Lord deal with them. Let the Lord deal with them. Because when we get treated wrong, when somebody does wrong, when they wrong us, we want to set it right, don't we? You know why it says in the Bible that, that an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth? That's so we, so we don't go further than that. Eye for an eye, I'm taking your whole head. <laughs> right? <laughs> it's just. We're more good than that. But think about that. Let the Lord deal with those who abuse, mistreat. You're serving the Lord. Not them. The Lord will deal with it. And He'll deal with us too. We're the ones that do wrong. There's no partiality. The Lord is just. Verse, chapter 4, verse 1. Masters, give your bond servants what is just and fair, knowing that you also have a master in heaven. Okay, that puts us back in that place of being the boss, the employer. People that are working, that are doing things for us in whatever way, and serving us. You go to the restaurant after church today and, and get a meal. That puts you in this place. Because they're serving, they're working for you in a sense. That puts us in that place of being the master. If you're an employer, if you're the boss, treat those who work under you the way that they ought to be treated. You know, be fair, be gracious, be merciful, and don't let them get away with whatever it is they want to do. We've got people that sometimes when they're, they're not doing their job, they're not doing it right, there needs to be correction. You know, but it doesn't have to come from an angry... Nobody yelling at them like that. You can do that in a very gracious way. Masters, give them what... But they should it be just and fair, knowing that you also have a master. You might be the boss, but you still got a Lord. He's still, he's still your boss. You report to him. Be just and fair. Talking about the wages and stuff. They want their work, if that's up to you. Be just and fair with your people. Be just and fair. Take into consideration sometimes the things that may be going on in their life. I have a gentleman at work that, that, that works with me, one of the grounds guys and everything, and his wife has been being treated for the last almost year for breast cancer. She's coming through very nicely. It's great for her. He's needed a lot of grace in this last year. There's been times where he's come to me and understanding his situation. He goes, man, I hate to do this right now. He says, I got to go. 
something's up, I need to take my wife. Somebody was supposed to take me to a doctor and they can't make it, I gotta go. It's like, go. I've had a situation where, where other people come up and say, hey man, my buddy called me, we got a poker game going tonight, see ya. Ah, no, no, no. Why well, don't you let him go? Yeah, that's different. The situation calls for different things. But to be fair, give them what they deserve. Be just. To treat them fairly. To be a good boss. Somebody that they don't mind working for. But at the same time, be just. Just means hold them accountable. This is your job. You need to get it done. I've told people before, it's like, I don't, you know, they talk about break time, so they ask, you know what, I don't care about your breaks. I care about your work. Your work's done and it's done right and it's done good, then good. But if your not, work's not getting done and it's not getting done right, and I find out, yeah, you took more breaks than, you know, more times, that, then that's going to change. Be fair, be just. Be understanding. Deal with them in a right way. Deal with them in such a way that they see the grace and the mercy, but also the justice of your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Because even as you're the boss, you still represent Him. You still have a master. You're accountable to Him. Might be your place, it might be your company, you might be the owner, but might stop with you. As far as this world's concerned, if you're a believer, you are, your Lord and Savior, your Master, Jesus Christ, you're accountable to Him. Who do you really work for? Jesus. Who do you really serve? Jesus Christ. In every situation. So if you're the, the employee, the bond servant, be a good one. If you're the Master, be a good one. Because we all serve Him. And there's no partiality. Lord. Chapter 4, verse 2. Continue earnestly in prayer. Be vigilant in it with thanksgiving. Meanwhile, praying also for us that God would open to us a door for the word, or for the word, to speak the mystery of Christ, for which I am also in chains, that I may make it manifest as I ought to speak. Walking in wisdom toward those who who are outside, redeeming the time, let your speech always be with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer each one. It goes on and it's continuing earnestly in prayer, our relationship with each other as believers. Let's continue earnestly in prayer, being vigilant. Have you ever been vigilant? What does it mean to be vigilant? You're paying attention. You're taking note. You're noticing. Being vigilant. You're watching out for what? Things to pray about. Be vigilant in your prayer life. You ever been in that place where you're just doing something? No matter what it is you're doing, you're driving down the road and everything, and the Lord just puts someone on your heart? A lot of times you do well, I don't know what's going on with them. I don't know how to pray for them. It doesn't matter. Pray for them. Be vigilant. Be paying attention for those things. Be vigilant. Diligent in prayer. Do it often. Do it on purpose. Do it continually. Lifting those up around you. Be earnest in prayer. Be sincere. Be sincere. We get those prayer requests and everything and as Laura sends them out through the through the prayer line and all that. Pray for them. Oh, here's a prayer. That's right. What I left one. Ernest. Lord, please take care of them. Let it come from the heart. Pray with thanksgiving. Gratitude. Lord, thank you for hearing my prayers. Not just for me, but for them, for others. Be grateful in those prayers when we see what the Lord's done. By the way, if you're a believer, there's no such thing as unanswered prayer. You throw that in there, 
There's no such thing as unanswered prayer. There's a song that used to somebody sing, thank God for unanswered prayers. Well, if you're a Christian, you're praying, He hears your prayers and He answers them. Sometimes He says no. Huh? It's easier for us when we say, well, God didn't answer my prayer than to say God said no. No, why? Because it's not what, it's not what we need. It's not the right thing. Yeah. Paul, when he prayed the three times about the, the infirmity that he had, God said what? Nope. Was that an unanswered prayer? No, clearly it wasn't. God said no. My grace is sufficient. You got what you need. Just carry on. Pray earnestly with thanksgiving. Be thankful. Meanwhile, he says to pray for us that God would open to us a door for the word to speak the mystery of Christ for which I am also in chains. That's why Paul was in prison. God opens the door. Look at uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 16. Verse 8. He says, But I will tarry in Ephesus until Pentecost, for a great and effective door has opened to me. And there are many adversaries. God is the one that opens the doors, doesn't He? What He opens, no one can close. What He closes, no one can open. Have you ever found yourself trying to shove some door open that God has closed? Well, you can get real tired real quick trying to do that. You know? I remember... Remember a, a, a little cartoon that I saw one time, a long time ago. A little cartoon, and the sign on the door says, pull. And guys, push, 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 push. I mean, we've all done that. Turn <laughs> the door wide open. It says, pull. <laughs> oh. Sometimes we do that with the, with the Lord too and serving Him. I want to go do this ministry. Lord, nope. Nope, nope. And here we are pushing on the door and it says, Boom. What about it the wrong way? And he's opened the door. Now, Paul seeing this, this opportunity in, in Ephesus, which we'll be going there now. Ephesus, where he spent the most time, he says, Man, there, there's, a, there's a door open here, man. There's a great opportunity to, to minister. And sometimes we look at that and say, man, everything's so great and wonderful. The door's wide open. Look at it. Just a piece of cake to get in here and minister. And everything's got to be great and wonderful. It was so easy. It had to be the Lord. Right? Paul says, there's a great door open here. And there's many adversaries. Wait a minute. We run into adversarial things and things might don't get so easy and all that. Like well, well, maybe it wasn't the Lord. Well, if the door is open, go through it. You might need to watch your step. There might be adversaries on the other side. There might be those that try to prevent you from going through it. But if the Lord's opened it, then go through it. Go through that and trust Him. The Lord's open that door. So pray God will open the door for us for the Word to speak the mystery of Christ. Pray for God to open that door. Don't be one of those Christians that we've all run into and, and seen who try to shove that door open and minister and witness to people. You know, I knew a guy, we were all part of a Christian motorcycle club and he was about that big. You know, big old burly dudes and all that stuff. And, you know, got his leather on and Christian biker dude. Ready? And he'd go a couple people. You know the Lord Jesus Christ? You know that He died on the cross for you to save you? Ready? And you got people going. <laughs> and by the time we were back in court, it's like, man, I'll pray to you want to do it. Don't back it up and leave it alone. But when the Lord opens the door, when He makes that appointment, when He gives that opportunity and everything, there might be that little doubt. We've been in that place where we've with the Lord saying, you don't talk to that person. Oh, I don't know who they are. I don't know what they need to know. I don't know that much. I don't know the four spiritual laws of the Roman Roman. It doesn't matter. Do you know Jesus? Then trust Him. 
Let him be the one that opens that door instead of trying to push it open. But don't be afraid to step through it. Even when your own fears or other things try to prevent you. You work at a place like a, a school and everything, and unfortunately, most people, even Christians, believe that they cannot share their faith in that situation. Oh, you can too. You can too. And the Lord often opens those doors. I remember one time, this, this kind of struck me as one of the really cool times of good pleasure, where the Lord opened the door to minister as I was working at this at, at a different high school and talking to one of the secretaries there, and I knew that she was a believer, and we were talking about some stuff that was going on with her and, and talking about it and, and talking about the Lord and what He's doing and everything and, and doing that. And I looked at her and I said, well, do you want to pray about it? Can we pray about this? She goes, yeah. And so we prayed right there in front of God, the principal, and everybody. And I knew the principal wasn't a believer. And I knew that he was in the office right next door. And his door was open. So I prayed, Lord! <laughs> but the Lord opened that door very little in this case. For him to hear that conversation about trusting the Lord through those difficult situations. Pray that the Lord opens the doors. And he will. He will close the ones that need to be closed and open the ones that are open. Be faithful. Be a faithful servant to the Lord and do what He puts before you. So Paul said, pray for them. He's in chains. He says in verse 4, he said, that I may make it manifest as I ought to speak. In spite of those chains, Paul still wanted to preach the gospel. The very thing that got him put into those chains also in the first place. Like going to jail for being a Christian. We, we've asked that before, haven't we? If being a Christian was a crime, would there be enough evidence to convict you? Not just on your safety, but as they, they went around and questioned the people in your life, would there be enough evidence? And if you were convicted, would you still preach the gospel, even when you were put in jail for it? Paul said, yep, the Lord's opening doors, even in, the, in these chains, to, to preach the gospel. Verse 5, he says, walk in wisdom toward those who are outside, redeeming the time. Let your speech always be with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer each one. It's so talking about us praying for one another, looking for the doors that God opens and all that stuff, ministering to one another in prayer and all that. Now he moves to those that are outside. Those who are outside, those in the world, those that are not saved. Walk in wisdom towards those who are, out, who are outside, redeeming the time. When that door's open, there's opportunity to take advantage of that time. Don't put it off. You know, Lord, I know you wanted me to talk to him today, but I was kind of doing something else and everything, and, and I'll get to it tomorrow. Don't put it off. Because today is the day of salvation. Redeeming that time as the Lord leads you to minister to others. Because let your speech always be with grace, seasoned with salt. Let your speech always be with grace. Remember the big burly biker dude and corner people and all that? You know, threatening them into, into, into heaven? It doesn't work. Sometimes as Christians and those outside, those unbelievers are usually pretty good at it, to engaging us in such a way that we get upset. Have you ever been in an argument with somebody about their need for salvation? Have you ever had an argument with somebody about the grace of God? Have you ever had an argument with somebody about His mercy? Have you ever had an argument about His love for them? People will argue with you about the things of the Lord. They'll draw you in. And we get passionate sometimes angry. So be wise. Matthew chapter 10, the Lord says to be wise as serpents, but harmless as doves. Sometimes we're wise as doves. 
and harmless as serpents in that approach. Be wise. Redeem the time. Approach them with grace. Season with salt. That means grace, yes. Love, forgiveness. Grace, mercy. But the salt is those who believe are saved, those who do not are condemned already. The salt is Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Oh, praise God. No one comes to the Father except through me. There is no other way. Season with salt. We're to be salt and light. I got these flashlights now that are like 10,000 lumens or whatever it is, and you turn one of the things on, and you know, everybody on the block goes blind. <laughs> yeah? It's a little extreme. Be salt and light. That's not the kind of light that draws people in, is it? It's that light, that warm light that draws them in. You see, you see a campfire, and it's interesting about campfires. You got that campfire there, and maybe you are sitting around a campfire just lighting things up, and you can see right around you, and the people that are there, you can tell when your marshmallows are burning and the s'mores are done and all that stuff. And that light, you look at that, and you start looking off out there, and you don't see too much. But if you're outside of that, if you're way off over here, and the campfire's over there, you can be way out in the darkness. And you see that campfire, that nice warm glow from that campfire. And you see what those people and what they're sharing and everything around that campfire. And you can see from way up in the darkness that light. And you realize you may to be light. That light serves what you do. People can see. Not put them in a basket. To be salt. You ever have the lid come off a salt shaker? <laughs> one of them tricks, one of the smart out kids are doing a in the restaurant and everything, loose in the cap. How many of you have done that? You don't have to read it. <laughs> you order, you do that, you pour it out, or you put the salt in the sugar thing. You know, get that. Get too much salt, what does it do? That just ruins it, right? It's too harsh. But when you put the right amount of salt on something, man, it just hmm, adds that flavor to it, brings the flavor out of it, just makes it so good. I found out, just, just in case you don't know this, if you like a good steak, nice tender steak, take that and use sea salt, or the, the kosher salt, not table salt, and just put that on there on both sides of it and, and let that thing sit for about an hour before you cook it. And then that salt just tenderizes that and makes it so nice and juicy. Don't put too much on it. <laughs> or too little. See, that salt does its work. It's perverse, it's a preservative, it's, it's a cleaner, it's a disinfectant. Why did they put salt on your wound? Why did your, your moms and grandmothers and whatever, why did they do that? It made you scream, right? <laughs> because it has a disinfecting and a preserving thing to it. It adds flavor. Those out in the world, redeem the time as the Lord opens those doors. Don't be afraid. Step out there, talk. Don't waste time. Share the gospel when you can. But be do it wisely. That your words, your speech, always be with grace. Unmerited favor. But season with salt. Don't lose the truth of the gospel. So as Jesus died on the cross to save us because we need it to be saved. Make sure it's all in there. Salt that you may know how you ought to answer each one. The Lord will bring you there. Well, I'm not going to finish. I'll have to go a little bit next week. Well, let's pray. Father, we thank you so much, Lord. And Lord, you... Show us how we ought to serve you. Lord, you call us to deny ourselves, to take up our crosses and follow you. Lord, we're not left to sort it out, to figure it for ourselves, to determine what's right and what's wrong. Lord, you show us the way. The way, the truth, and the life. Lord, we thank you that through you we can come to the Father. Lord, let us always be salt and light. Let us always do whatever it is that 
that comes before us, whatever doors you open to go through, whether there be adversaries or not, Lord, let us trust you. Let us be faithful in serving you with our whole hearts. Let us be gracious and merciful. Let us have just the right amount of salt to speak the truth and stand firm on it. Let us be an example of Christ-likeness in our homes, our families, our workplaces, in our churches, and in the world around us. Let us be that salt and light that shines and glorifies you. Jesus, in your name we pray. Amen. All right, we will see you next time.